Good morning, spring of life. We are so glad that you have joined us this day to worship God together. We pray that in this time, you will be reminded of God's love for you, that you are not alone, and that you will find a space where you can connect with others. If you are watching us for the first time, we especially want to welcome you and we want to hear from you about uh, what you need from us and, uh, and who you are. So be sure to connect with us. There's lots of good information uh, in the video description about how to do that. And we just want to invite you into all that God is doing in our midst. Check out some exciting news and announcements. Good morning, Spring of Life. We are so glad you joined us for worship today. And before we get started, we have some exciting updates to share with you. After much prayer, conversation, research, discernment, and your feedback, our church leadership has made the decision to move into our next phase of reimagining and returning to worship in person for the season of Lent. Starting February 21st, we will be starting two new in-person services. At 9.30 a.m., we will be holding a 30-minute prayer and communion service inside the sanctuary. This service will include live prayer, reflection, and Holy Communion. The sanctuary will remain open for individual prayer after the service, and as always when we are on campus, masks and distancing will be required. Then at 11 a.m., we will have an outdoor service for all ages that includes live music from the worship team, reflection, and Holy Communion. Outdoor childcare for ages three and under will be available, and this service will be designed to engage children and adults in the worship experience. Bring your own chairs, blankets, and umbrellas to sit on the lawn, or join us from the safety and comfort of your own car using your FM radio for a drive-in option. This service will be live streamed to our online platforms for those still worshiping with us from home. And again, for the safety of everyone, we will require masks and distancing on the lawn as well. And to kick off the Lenten season, we invite you to join us for a live Ash Wednesday service on Zoom, February 17th at 7 p.m. You can pick up your ashes for the service outside the church at any time that day. And if you come from 7.30 to 9 a.m., you can drive through and receive your ashes to go and a blessing from Pastor Esther. Now, if you haven't already signed up for our weekly e-news updates yet, make sure to visit the link to sign up in this video description. This is where you can find more information about these worship updates and stay connected with us so you don't miss out on all the great things happening at Spring of Life every week. That's it for this week, church. Now let's worship together.
Come and join me for our children's moment. Over the past couple weeks, we've learned about Moses. We learned about Moses when his mom put him in the river and saved him. And we learned about how God spoke to him through a burning bush. Today, we fast forward the story a little bit after Moses saves the Israelites. They get to the wilderness and they're traveling. And as they're traveling, they get hungry and upset, maybe a little hangry if you've ever been hungry and angry before. And they say, Moses, what are we going to eat? We're hungry. At least in Egypt, we had food. So Moses turns to God in prayer and says, God, what are we supposed to eat? And God says, don't worry. I'll send food to the Israelites every day. So they went to sleep. And the next day when they woke up, there was food. There was quail, which is kind of like chicken, and there was manna. It was round, and it was yummy, and it tasted like honey. 
But the crazy part of this story is the Israelites still didn't trust God. They are like, how do we know God's going to provide tomorrow? So they had an idea. They decided to collect more manna than what they needed, and they decided to save it for the next morning. So they went to sleep, and the next morning when they woke up, they went to get their manna. Oh no, children. They can't eat this. This is molded and disgusting. The manna that they collected, the extra, was no good to eat. Children, this kind of reminds us that God's going to take care of us every day. God's going to take care of us today. God's going to take care of us tomorrow. God's going to take care of us the next day. We don't have to worry because God is with us. It kind of reminds me of the Lord's Prayer where we ask God, give us this day our daily bread. Wow, children, isn't it great that we can trust God is going to be with us today and tomorrow? Let's pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for being with us every single day. Remind us that you are with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, children. I hope you have a great week. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 21. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gave you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much they need. Take Omar for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by Omar, this one who had gathered much did not have too much, and the one who had gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let's pray. Walk with me, Lord.
walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. All along this old tedious journey, I want Jesus to walk with me. Loving and merciful God, as we gather this new day together from different places and different times even, we thank you that you are with us, that you walk with us not only this day, but every day, and that you are a God who is always more willing to hear than we are even to speak and ask and approach you. Thank you, God, for a day of new mercies, for the sun that rose, for the air in our lungs, and for the opportunity to gather with your people and to lift up to you our joys, our celebrations, our longings, and our deep sorrows. And to know, God, that they are held by you and also that as we share them, we are also holding each other. So God, continue to be with us in this time of worship. However we have made it here this day, whether fully trusting in your presence or not quite sure where you are, whether rejoicing in good news or in the midst of deep struggle, God, you meet us here. Here are cries for those who are sick, for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Here are cries for the unemployed, for those struggling to find housing. Here are cries for those struggling with depression and anxiety, for those struggling with addiction. Merciful God, heal your people, provide community, provide ways forward, and fill us with a passion for those who are hurting. God, we also give you thanks for the joys of children who participate in worship, for the joys of music, for the joys of seeing faces we love. Thank you for the joys of good news, of new beginnings, of answered prayers. And we give all our joys and our sorrows to you, knowing and trusting that you are with us. Be with us as we continue in this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in our series on Exodus. And in reality, we could study Exodus for basically the whole year. There is so much to cover so much richness to it. And so we're kind of jumping around a little bit uh, and doing the best we can to cover some of the pieces that speak to us in this particular season of the world and of our church, and maybe of our own lives. Lessons from this, which has, this book, which has been called the Gospel of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. If you remember from the past couple of weeks, or if you haven't been able to join us, there's a lot that's gone on even in the first couple of chapters. We start off by Joseph's family has become a nation in Egypt. And Pharaoh, the ruler, who we uh, have said is like the classical dictionary uh, picture of the oppressor, Pharaoh, who doesn't know about God, is afraid of these others. Actually, I really wish we were gathered together, um, which uh, hopefully we can be. We're planning to soon, but I really wish because I would I would invite you. So do this at home, even though I can't hear you. Every time uh, you hear Pharaoh, uh, just think of uh, just kind of boo. Say boo. Boo him. This idea of Pharaoh in this story is classic 
against God, oppressor. And this guy, Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh is one who is oppressing these persons even harder, basically because he's afraid of them to the point of wanting to kill newborn Hebrew boys. And we see God at work through some courageous women of different ethnicities, different backgrounds. And they rescue this Hebrew baby by the name of Moses. Moses then is raised in um, the Egyptian Pharaoh's house as he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. Um, and Moses has a lot of stuff going on internally. He realizes he's a Hebrew, and so he sees his people being oppressed, but he lives in this palace, and so there's just lots of tension. I often think of Moses, and I'm like, bless his heart. Like, he needs some, like, several year worth of therapy. Like, he needs some space to work out that whole, he's got some identity crisis and issues happening. But apparently he didn't have counseling, because all of that bu bubbles up and kind of explodes. And we see that he ends up killing another person, premeditating and killing another person. Uh, Pharaoh finds out Moses ends up fleeing. We're told he goes into uh, the desert, uh, the wilderness part. He marries. And last week we talk about Moses, an unexpected kind of character given his history, he's minding his own business, tending sheep in the wilderness, and God shows up. Moses, I said, minding his own business, and God just pops up and says, hey, I got work for you to do. Moses struggles with God and is like, are you wrong? You have the wrong person. Can't be me. And Eventually, um, God sends uh, Moses a partner um, named Aaron who helps him even where he can't speak well. And we're told, and these are the parts that we often see in movies about Moses, like uh, we're told that they go to Pharaoh, they insist on letting Moses' people go uh, because the reason God had called Moses is because it tells us he had heard the cries of his people who were being oppressed in Egypt and calls Moses to do something. Um, so Moses and Aaron are telling Pharaoh, let my people go. Signs are happening that symbolically shadow uh, what this future oppression looks like. There's plagues. They decide to let him go finally. And after the people have been released and are following Moses out of Egypt, Pharaoh changes his mind and we see that um, they pursue the people and the people find themselves literally between a rock and a hard place, between an army and water. And it tells us that the people doubted, but that God was there despite their doubt. And uh, these are the big scenes again in the movies. The waters part, the people pass. The army of Pharaoh is engulfed in the water. And it is a beautiful scene of how God was present and provided, even in the midst of doubt. But the story of Exodus doesn't end there. Some movies do end there. That's kind of like the really exciting part. And oh man, they've been freed from Egypt. Everything's good now. Uh, they, the land of milk and honey has been reached. But that's not what happens. This is actually wilderness time for the people. And Dan Erlander, a Lutheran pastor, tell, calls this time wilderness school, where in reality, they spend 40 years unlearning uh, lots of bad habits, um, and having to relearn what it looks like to be God's people. Um, Dan Erlander, Erlander and Alan Story, who's a South African pastor, uh, talk about this time as a season of birthing this nation. So even the number of 40, 40 years is symbolic because 40 is in scripture in a bunch of places um, as the symbolic number. We know that 40 weeks is the gestation period for women, right? 
before they give birth. This is a story of new birth. It's not uh, very long after this moment of this deep, this major high of like, they just saw water part and walked through that we get our first teachable moment in wilderness school. Lesson number one, we get the people who, they just start complaining. They tells us they're complaining and grumbling. Now, to be fair, they were complaining and grumbling about food. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I get hangry, right? Like I love that Snickers video with Betty White where uh, Betty White is playing football and just being real nasty. And then they give Betty White a Snickers bar and she turns into the normal person. Um, I get the hangry piece. Um, so I've wondered, were they just hangry? Cause they were out in the wilderness now and they were like, well, we're going to die out here. We hungry. Where is God now? But I don't think that the congregation was grumbling precisely because they were hungry or hangry, because this is kind of characteristic of them. This is not the first time that they were grumbly people. Now, this is where we see God respond again in a really amazing way. God responds not in anger, but with showers of blessing. It tells us that they received quail and a bread substance called manna, which literally means, what is it? The text is most concerned about the manna, and this is something that they were going to receive each day. They were supposed to trust God every day to provide their daily needs, their daily bread. The sustaining care of God was not only for that moment of the parting of the waters, but God was saying, was like, no, y'all, I got you. Here is bread that will come every day. But this bread, very specifically, the reason it came every day was because they were going to receive enough for each day. Again, wish I could hear your answers. So maybe you can write them in the chat. But what is enough? What do you think about when you think about enough? Maybe it's, I mean, a synonym is sufficient. It is just the right amount, perhaps. Um, per perfection? Um, what do you think about being enough? It's not too much. It's not more than is needed. It is what is needed. Enough. Now, that's a curious word to think about um, in this passage. And it made me wonder, because um, looking through the Old Testament, there's a lot of conversations around food and farming and um, the land and God providing. So it made me think of, is there enough food in the world to feed all of the people of the world? There is. It's pretty well documented. Are all of the people of the world fed? Do all of the people of the world have enough food? No. Why do you think that is? What might be some reasons as to why that's the case? I wonder if our story from this morning may enlighten some on why that might be. I saw a statistic which is kind of old now. It's before the pandemic. Uh, it's a couple of years old. Um, that says that Americans throw away approximately $165 billion worth of food each year. And for the average American family, that can be up to $2,200 per household. More than 20 pounds of food per person every month, so 240 pounds a year per person. 
That all adds up to 35 million tons of food each year. And I've actually seen higher estimates too. And that's a sad statistic considering hunger in America, which according to Feeding America, again, before the pandemic, one in seven Americans or 46.5 million people use food banks. I know I've had serious moments of conviction on this. Um, just a, even a month or two ago, I was going through my freezer, uh, trying to create make space as if because uh, it was so stocked up uh, figuring out what were the things that I were so old or that I didn't want to use and I wondered to myself how was that a good use of the gifts God had given me same thing with like the drawers in my home the you know bursting with clothes or maybe other things we're told in the story that we can trust God for our daily bread, that God gives enough, not too much, not too little. And the text specifically says that some gathered more and some less, and that they all had enough to go around. This new creation of God at work, what God intended this creation of people that were God's people to be, is where everyone has enough to go around. Now, what happened in this text then might enlighten us about the why the disparities around. There's enough food, but not enough, not everyone's fed. It, to it tells us that some people decided to hoard the manna, to take even when they weren't supposed to. And when they did that, that the manna didn't last, that instead it spoiled. It grew maggots, hoarding spoils. This is a major lesson in wilderness school. Again, a conviction for me, how many of us are hoarders and not of the you know diagnosable sickness kind of hoarding, um, but how many of us have more than enough of a lot of things while some of us not have more than enough in a lot of things. That we hoard says that we have yet to recognize that all we have, all that is around is because of God's goodness. It's not because we're so good that we can gather manna better than others. It's not because we're so good that, um, that we deserve it more than others. We still fail to see, as Terrence Fretheim says, that the world of God's creation, including the distribution of food resources, is to be structured that those who gather, those who gather little still have no lack. Israel fails to live into the responsibilities put on them, and both Moses and God are mad. And they're not mad because they broke a rule. They're not mad because what they said was ignored. They're mad because hoarding spoils, not just literally, but to not follow these instructions has an effect on God's new creation and on their relationship with God and with each other. They demonstrate that for one, they are not interested in God's will for the best life possible. And they threaten to undo what God has done for them. God created a people where all had enough. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there either. Even in the face of hoarding, even in the face of misuse and the failure of the test, let's say, God's graciousness prevails. This manna continues to come on a regular basis, right up to the border of the land filled with milk and honey. So all 40 years. Scripture reveals a means of life and grace rather than a life of destruction and death. Once again, a life of manna, enough, and mercy. 
The sustaining care of God not only was present when the waters parted, but in the daily bread. And this week, as I reflect on this passage, it makes me ask the question is whether I, whether you, whether we will live into that new creation, into that people God is making us, or will we choose to reject, choose to not trust and to miss out on that beauty where we might all know that we're enough and have enough, where our hoarding doesn't spoil, but we live into being a different kind of people. I invite you to, even as we celebrate in Holy Communion, or if that's not a particularly quiet moment for you, but if you find a quiet moment at some point in this day or in this week, to think about that, about how God might be inviting you to live in new ways into the God of manna and mercy so that we might be a people who are a new kind of people. We all have enough. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we have come to the time in our worship service where we give back to God our gifts through our tithes and our offering. And so I invite you to take a moment to think about how you are going to give back to your church. There are three ways that you can give. You can give online, you can text to give, or you can mail in your check to the church. However you decide to give, know that it is an act of faith to commit to God's kingdom in this way. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you these gifts of our tithes and our offering. We offer them up to you with full faith that you will turn them into a blessing for others. And so we ask that you take these gifts and you make them your own for your kingdom come. Amen. We now have the joy of celebrating in Holy Communion together. So if you uh, don't have elements ready, you can go grab them now, uh, whether it's bread or crackers, juice or water, you are welcome and invited to celebrate in this, which is Christ's table, uh, which is open to all people. We remember this story about how on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus gathered together with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and offered it to them and said, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. After the supper was over, he took the cup and once again gave thanks and offered it to them and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as we participate in this meal, we proclaim a God who invites us, who welcomes us to God's table, who welcomes us all because there is enough for all and who longs to heal us, strengthen us, feed us for the journey ahead. Let's pray. Loving and merciful God, we give you thanks for this holy meal that we get to uh, participate in with you and with our church family around the world and across time. We ask God for your forgiveness in the ways that we forget, that we forget who we are, who you have created us to be, who you have called us to be as a people. Forgive us for not loving you with our whole hearts. Forgive us for not loving our neighbors. Forgive us for not loving ourselves. Free us, God, for joyful obedience. Free us, God, for a life of service. Free us, God, for a life of seeking justice. And pour out your spirit on us, gathered wherever we might be. And on these gifts of bread and cup, Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood and by your spirit, make us one. One with you, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world as we serve your creation, as we anticipate your coming, where we will all feast together. Through Christ we pray, amen. And as always, if you are alone, you may serve yourself. If you are with others, you may serve each other. This is the body and blood of Christ given for you. Thanks be to God.
as you go on with the rest of your day. May you remember the God who is with us, the God who provides, and the God who gives enough for all. May we follow that God. May we live as that new creation of a people that God has created. May we find peace and comfort and call in that God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.